All right, good late evening, everybody. It is Steve with Real Progressives. You know, not a whole lot has changed since the great global financial crisis of 2007, 2008, 2009, etc. hit us. In fact, none of the banking regulations have really been modified in any way, shape, or form. The only thing that really happened was the mortgage industry and these other big banks got bailed out of their own financial and fiscal disaster that they created. And we, the people, were never made whole. Most of us were in such a severe hole that anything, savings of any variety, was completely wiped out. Now, when you think about this, so much of our ability to survive the ebbs and flows of the regular business cycle are highly dependent on us being able to have some form of disposable cash. Now, folks, this is kind of first world problems for people that are in the middle class. The people in the middle class, they're having a hard time. They're struggling. The middle class, which is kind of like a joke. Because we've all kind of become the 99%. Sure, there's some people that have a little bit more bandwidth in their life than others. But the average person, even with a job, even with unemployment at low figures, we are still starved for the ability to survive the next crisis. And with nothing changing, and the focus on anything but economics around here, you got to wonder, how will we as a nation respond to the next global financial crisis? Ask yourself, if you got laid off tomorrow, would you be able to survive three months without a job? Would you be able to last six months without a job? How about nine months? How about a year? How about 18 months? For many during the first global financial crisis, they were out of work for over 18 months. We were losing jobs in the hundreds of thousands every single month. Nothing has changed at all. Nothing. And when you look at people and their health care, you realize that you're one illness away from being bankrupt. You're one business decision away from being homeless. You can put your head in the sand. You can pretend like this isn't real. Because it's probably easier to pretend that it's not real. But we have not put anything in place to safeguard the regular people. Average Joe America, Jane and Joe America are screwed. We have not seen any uptick in wages. We have not seen any protections against predatory lending. We have not seen any protections in terms of a federal job guarantee. We've not seen any protections at all in terms of health care. Folks, we are still stranded in global financial crisis America, and we're acting as if everything's fine. We're living as if everything is 100% fine. We're looking at candidates and we're trying to decide if we like the way they speak to us, if we like the way they comb their hair, if we like the outfit that they're wearing. You know, I think to myself, I obviously have my exact candidate in mind who I want to be president. I don't think it's any secret who I want to be president. But not naming names aside momentarily. Whenever I hear another candidate, even ones I wouldn't piss on their head to put out a fire, when they start talking economics and they start talking about financial regulations, I listen. I listen hard. 
Because even though I have a candidate that I expect and hope to win, and I have no confidence whatsoever that if that candidate doesn't win, that we'll be okay. But when I listen to the other candidates, I am listening very intently to hear what their thoughts are on the environment, or not just the environment, but the economics of our country, the banking regulations. I'm listening to what they're doing. And I want to tell you something. Even when you hate a candidate because they might get elected, whether you like it or not, they may get elected or they may get selected or whatever. But if you hear candidates talking about economics, you need to be paying attention. That doesn't mean that you have to support them. But it does mean that instead of just saying, I don't like so-and-so, they sold out or whatever, you need to listen and listen hard. Because first of all, these candidates, they're not the ones that create these plans. They're not the ones that come up with the strategies. They're not. They ask economists and other people, activists, you name it, different consultants to come up with the plans for them to address certain problems. They go out and they try and find out whether or not people support them or not. There is an incredible amount of work that has to be done to make any one of us whole should another financial crisis hit. Now, you all may not realize this. Maybe you went unscathed. Maybe you didn't have any worries whatsoever during the last one. You just kept on going to work and everything was hunky-dory. I want to tell you my story real quick so that you understand why this matters so much to me. In 2009, I had just gotten my second master's degree. Actually, I got it in 2008. But in 2009, I was working at Verizon. It's my 17th year with Verizon. And they asked if anybody wanted to have an early out because they were going to lay off 10,000 people. 10,000 people. And I raised my hand and I said, Psh, I got two master's degrees. I got a metric ton of certifications. Go ahead and put me on that list. I, I'm sure I'll do fine out in the real world. I got this retirement that's set up. I've got my 401k. You know, I've got some money saved. I've done okay. I'll be fine. I didn't really think they would take me up on it, but they did. They took me up on it and I was out the door. And so I looked around and I tried to find a job. One job hired me to be like a senior director slash vice president for a 4G wireless rollout. They did a background check on me and found out that way back when I had gotten arrested for having possession of marijuana and they rescinded the offer. And that was the last sniff of employment that I got from anyone other than my own private workings for 18 months. It took me 18 months to get a job. And when I finally did get a job, it was at one third of the pay that I had made previously. I had spent my entire life savings trying to keep my upside down home afloat. And then what was left was taken from me in divorce. I would look out the slats of my windows to see if the bankers were coming to uh, repossess my home, which had fallen deeply in arrears. Everything was going to hell. To this day, I have severe PTSD over it. I've never recovered personally. Personally, I've been through more ups and downs. I can't find permanent work. The work that I've been able to find has been contract work. So you sign up for a year, two years, three years, but you're at will. There's nothing permanent about that. There's nothing secure about that. And I'm left to decide. I've got to get a surgery on my knee. What happens if I'm out of commission? Will my job let me go? They don't have any 
compelling reason to keep me other than I do a good job. The point is that I'm completely at will. There's nothing to defend me at all. There's nothing to secure my employment. So making plans, making, trying to protect my family, good Lord, it's almost impossible. And I'm just one middle class American. The people that were really destroyed back in the day have never recovered either. And if you can imagine getting knocked down by a wave and as the wave rescinds, you're trying to get the cobwebs out of your head and before you even stand up again, another wave comes and knocks you down and drowns you. That's what this next crisis would look like to most people that have not recovered from that. So during this presidential election, I look at each candidate and I say, what are you going to do for the economy? What are you going to do to protect regular Americans? Are you looking out for some? Are you looking out for all? Are you trying to prop up group A against group B? Or are you looking at lifting up all boats? I'm looking to see who is going to regulate the banks. Who is going to take a stab at breaking up the big banks? Who's going to take a stab at reinstituting something like a modern glass steagle? Who's going to end predatory, predatory student debt? Who's going to make it so that Americans aren't going bankrupt over health care? Who is going to make it so that their health care isn't tied to a job and an employer that may or may not decide to let you go the next day just because. I want to know which candidates are going to make it so that my life doesn't hang in the balance based on my employer's whim. That may not be a big deal to you all. Maybe you can put your head in the sand. But it's still too painful for me. And it's 2019. 2009. 10 years. Almost to the day. My last day at Verizon was July 24th, 2009. We're coming up on the 10 year mark here. And I assure you, nothing has changed. Nothing at all. If it hits again. What will you do? Which candidate do you think has the most robust programs for regular Americans? Universal, not just for group A because they have gender X or Melton Y or, you know, whatever. Which one is supporting all people? Which one has the most robust New Deal style platform? Which one can you count on to stay consistent? Which one didn't ebb and flow? Which one has the best economic team? Which one, at the end of the day, has stood for the same unapologetically democratic socialist principles for the last 40 plus years. Not which one sometimes is or is seeking markets and a proud capitalist. No, which one is out there letting you know exactly how it is leading the charge, working with the likes of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Which one supports the framework for a Green New Deal, which includes, by the way, a federal job guarantee? You ever thought about some, you know, when you think about the quote unquote off fossil fuels act, have you ever thought about how easy it would be if people didn't have egos and pride 
that they could make that part of the Green New Deal instead of trying to run against the Green New Deal and shit on a Green New Deal? Can you imagine what it would be like if egos weren't involved in that? Huh. But instead, there's a lot of people out there that don't think about the economics of it all because they just, I don't know, maybe they don't have the aptitude. Maybe they're not smart enough to think about it. Maybe they are trying to impress people by not thinking about it. I don't know. But there are people out there that try to say that the Off Fossil Fuels Act is greater than the Green New Deal. Green New Deal is a framework. All Fossil Fuels Act is a very narrow thing. doesn't include a job guarantee. In fact, the person proposing the All Fossil Fuels Act is opposed to a federal job guarantee, which makes that individual a non-starter for the economically literate. So who is going to take care of us? Should there be another meltdown? And let me tell you why there's reason to believe that there could be a meltdown. While unemployment is low, people are not making good money. People are living very tight. People do not have spare cash just laying around. People are not able to protect themselves. There's record debt out there, private debt. It's unsustainable. Wages are not keeping up with the debt. Eventually it gets to a point where there's a bubble and it bursts. Companies have gone and leveraged themselves so severely to buy back their stocks. There is a huge debt bubble ready to hit right there. And the student loan debt, it's not just about the students and relieving them of the burden of predatory student loans. No, it's about all of us and providing a robust economy because one person's spending is another person's income, unless you don't do science, unless you're not a thinker. So naturally, when people have more disposable income available to them, People tend to get the things they actually need instead of holding off on surgery or instead of holding off on taking care of repairs on the house. But we don't have any of that flex in the economy. The average person doesn't have $500 in their bank account. There is no fat to be trimmed in the average American household. We haven't even talked about the poor and the new poor that were made poor from the last crisis. Now, here's the problem. Most of the times when you hear lefties talk, they're preaching to the initiated. They're talking to people that already feel exactly like them. It's like screaming into a barrel and everybody's singing back. But unfortunately, to make the kind of changes we need to prevent a new, horrible, global financial crisis, we need to appeal beyond our bubble, which means we have to start structuring our language such to reach those people. That means that our way may not be the only way to reach other people because we end up tapping out the number of people that are quote unquote naturally inclined to be on our side. People oftentimes quote the number of independent voters out there as if we've got some massive majority. But last time I checked, many of those independent voters were laugh out loud LOL Bertarians. People that want to slash government, people that want to slash spending. That's not. A progressive. That's someone that doesn't understand economics or life in a society. So somehow or another, 
we got to cross over to share this message, to, sh to talk about this crisis with people that are beyond our little sphere. If all we're looking for is pats on the back, clicks and likes from like-minded people, well, that's all you'll get. That's your reward. You get to brag and say you won the interwebs because you got the most clicks and likes for your clickbait. But the real rolling up the sleeves and the real fix is talking to people who have a different opinion and having enough intellect, having enough experience, having studied and being thoughtful to bring them to your camp is the way we have to be in order to stop it because there's just not enough of us who speak this language. There are many people out there who are timid and afraid or centrists who are afraid of their own shadow who will just go along to get along. And unless you find a way to crack that, it's going to be a really, really difficult time to make the kind of changes we need to make, even with a Bernie Sanders president or someone like him. The problem comes in when people are afraid of change because we haven't taken the time to explain what the transition looks like because we haven't taken the time to explain the business case or the cause and effect or why, if we don't do this, what will happen? We say it in punchlines and we say it screaming and say it in shut down arguments. But what happens when you're talking to a Pete booty gig supporter or an Elizabeth Warren supporter? And all you did was call her Pocahontas. Or all you did was mock her for her blue outfit. How ready to listen to you talk about these vital issues do you think they're going to be? Now, I must admit, I run hot because I feel everything. I'm a total empath. And more importantly, I've lived the experience. I've lost much. And as much as I just want to yell and scream, and I do, the way forward has to be somehow or another winning support beyond our bubble. And I see an awful lot of burners and friends that don't have any room to grow beyond that. People need to be able to understand how to talk to a Tulsi Gabbard supporter if they're a burner and explain to them how her unwillingness to support a federal job guarantee hurts people if the next financial crisis hits. Her unwillingness to be economically literate is a serious problem. When you talk to someone who is unwilling to hear about Bernie because he's not a real Democrat, how do you cross that divide? Do you just yell and scream at him? How do you begin to break that down? Because like I started this thing off with, nothing's changed since the last global financial crisis. Nothing. And unfortunately, enough people made it through that unscathed so they don't really realize how much pain and suffering it brought regular people, much less the poor. So you got to ask yourself, do you want to win? And if you do, are you cutting your nose off to spite your face? And by when, I don't mean get your favorite candidate elected. I mean on the issues. I can always tell a lightweight because they avoid issues. They avoid talking about the economics. That's when I know I'm in the presence of a lightweight.
somebody who hasn't done the homework. And it's that moment there that you realize the most important subject that directly impacts how we deal with climate change, how we deal with unemployment, how we deal with full employment, how we deal with health care, how we deal with student debt, how we deal with paid family and medical leave. Whether we fight for 15 or we set a federal job guarantee at a living wage with benefits and then call that the de facto minimum. When you don't take the time to understand the policy implications, you set yourself and all of us up for failure. Nothing has changed whatsoever since the last global financial crisis. People have less money in the bank, more debt. And in the end, if we don't take action now, if we don't prioritize the economy and economics so that we can address all the things that are on the table. We're in for a world of hurting when the next bubble bursts. And we'll have no one but ourselves to blame. So ask yourself, if the next global financial crisis hit, could you and your family survive it? I know for me, I don't want to find out. We can prevent it. We can elect MMT literate candidates. We can force at town halls candidates to address federal finance and explain the debt and deficits. We can force them to do that instead of just talking to candidates like they're our friends and shucking. We need to really hit them hard. And educate them on how federal finance actually works. There is no private sector without the government creating it. The government is the issuer of the dollar. So financial crises are government made. Whether it be from a lack of regulation a lack of understanding, a ideological belief of reducing deficits, whatever. If you don't prioritize economics really over all other things, none of the things you care about will come to be either. But at a more rudimentary level, most of us will be hit so hard and we'll have no backup plan. It'll be astounding if thousands don't perish. So as you go into this next period of time in the election process, and you're listening to candidates, and you're watching your friends posting on social media, and you're listening to alternative media. If they are not advancing modern monetary theory, they are failing you. If they're not advancing an understanding of how to regulate banks and regulate shadow banking, and if they are not talking about eradicating student loans, and if they're not outright talking about universal health care or a federal job guarantee, which would save us so much pain and misery should the crisis hit, they are really failing you. They're failing all of us. I want you to think about this long and hard. I can't go a day without thinking about it. 
every day I wonder, is today the day that I get to go through that again? And it is like torture. It's torture. If you don't understand, take the time to learn. It's worth it. It is absolutely worth it. And you know what? If you don't know anything more than just the fact that the United States government can afford everything we need without raising taxes to pay for it, because taxes do not pay for these programs. If you can just understand that much, then you can push your Congress critters and your senators and your governors to learn modern monetary theory and help stave off the next financial crisis. I'm Steve Grumbine with Real Progressives. Have a good night, everybody.